pray as a church together. In 1 Timothy, we learned in our last series this. Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, Therefore I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. For kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. We are going to pause and pray together as a church for those who are in authority, particularly over us in the state of California. Would you bow your heads and not just listen, but would you actively pray along with me in your heart? Father, we lift up the California State Board of Education and particularly the ex- ex- executive director, Brooks Allen. Lord, they are in charge of educating the young minds, grades K through 12 for this entire great state. That is an enormous responsibility. That is an enormous amount of time, years, hours they will spend hearing information. And Lord, we ask them that you would, we ask on behalf of them, Lord, that you would guide them into the fear of you as they come up with education. Lord, that you would give them righteousness of heart, righteousness of mind, as they are setting things in place, that our kids would hear truth, that our kids would hear you, that our kids would be able to discern truth even if they don't believe it. Lord, help our board of education. Lord, we also pray for our attorney general, Rob Bonta, who oversees lawyers, investigators, sworn peace officers, and he is in charge in large part of assisting in the administration of justice. And Lord, you are a God of justice. You care about the, the poor and the widow. You care that the orphan receives justice. And Lord, we ask that they would have a true understanding of your justice, ultimately in Christ and how you have poured out upon him our sins and forgiven us. But Lord, they would turn and administer biblical, true, godly, and good justice upon this world. And Lord, lastly, we lift up to you, Governor Gavin Newsom. As a leader of the state, Lord, his influence is it's great, it's even profound, of some 38 plus million people. Lord, we ask you that you would bless him to use his influence to administer your ways, your righteousness, and your truth. Lord, bless him to open up your holy word, that he would know you for himself, that he would fear you in his policies and his decision making. Lord, make him a godly leader that is strong in the face of ungodliness. And it's in your name we pray, Lord Jesus Christ, amen. trying to make a way that's already made a narrow road that I couldn't pave that leads to you I keep reaching for my place but I'm lost in a maze Where is my hope but in your grace Oh, your unending grace For where there's love without defense There is peace that makes no sense Where there is joy It's never without you Jesus, my God This heart is about you Lord, I stand in love And through this painful battle Oh, I surrender if Jesus, I am never without you, never without you. How can I run from where you are? You're already there. Where 
You're waiting for this broken heart You know so well For where there's love that does not fear Where there is peace amidst these tears Where there is joy It's never without you Jesus, my God This heart is about you Lord, I stand in awe And through this painful battle Oh, I surrender Jesus, I am never without you, never without you. Never without you. You understand my thoughts, oh God. Even when I am lost, my God, search every thought by every fall and lead me in your way. You understand my thoughts, Ooh, you understand my thoughts, oh God, even when I am lost, my Search every thought by every thought and lead me in your way. Lead me in your way. Where there is joy, it's never without you, Jesus, my God. This heart is about you, Lord, I stand in awe, through this painful battle, oh, I surrender to you, if Jesus, I am never without you, never without you. Christ, 
my King. What a wonderful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus. Death could not hold you, the veil tore before you, you silenced the most of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory, for you are raised to life. Lord, your name is incredibly powerful. Thank you that we get to come together and respond in worship, thanking you for your great power, which has not only created the world, but has made us born again, new creations in Christ. Thank you for your incredible power that is exercised in love, in grace, and in truth. Lord, we praise you. Be honored and delighted in your people here at Branch Church and across the world today, we do pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Go ahead and say hello to someone next to you. Good morning. Well, good morning, Branch Church. It is a blessing to be with you all this morning and all of our church family online as well. We're glad you're with us. What do Star Wars, Romeo and Juliet, Lord of the Rings, and Jurassic Park all have in common? They all have prologues. They all have this short introductory period in the book or the movie where they prepare you for the story and what's going to happen. We've seen it in Star Wars, in a galaxy far, far away, and then it scrolls through this background information and you're ready to jump into the story. Romeo and Juliet, you're introduced to a love that's born in between two warring houses. I don't know about you, but I'm like, I want to see what's going to happen next. Lord of the Rings introduces us to Middle Earth and some of its main characters, dwarves and humans, hobbits. I don't think there's any gnomes. I don't know the story that well. In Jurassic Park, one of my favorite prologues, we're introduced to a guy who's been wounded and has claimed he had a construction accident. But upon looking at his wounds, it's like, that doesn't look like construction, buddy. That looks like an animal ripped you apart. What happened? And as he's dying, he mutters this phrase, Ipso raptor. So raptor. And the reader's like, what's going on? But we know exactly what he said, right? He said, Velosa raptor. 
and you think, here we go. Today we are beginning the book of John. John 2 opens with a prologue, 18 verses designed to purposefully give you the broad picture of the story and also to introduce you to the themes of the rest of the 20 chapters, 20 plus chapters that we are going to read together. And as we read this prologue, these first 18 verses, we are going to learn this, that God has fully revealed himself and his salvation in a person. Yes, in a person. And this is where the Jedis, the Montagues, the Capulets, even the Velociraptors, Gandalf and Darth Vader lean in and go, I've got to see this. If you have your Bibles, turn with me please to John chapter one, beginning in verse one. There are many, there, there are multiple ways to look at this prologue. I'm gonna give you one that I like, that I came across in studying this time for the first time. I think there's one picture given here. God's revealed himself and his salvation in a person. And I think he's going to give this one picture three times. And in each time, it's gonna be filled in with a little more detail, a little more detail. We begin with this picture, chapter one, verse one. He says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The first three words in the beginning strike us because they're the very same three words that open the entire Bible. It is very likely, highly likely, I think even certainty that John is alluding to the very first three words of the entire Bible. And so when he opens the gospel, he actually takes us back to the very beginning. What was in the beginning? God, that was it. It was God. There was nobody else. There were no people, no planets, no galaxies, no life whatsoever. There was just God. And John tells us there's a little more to the story. In the beginning, there was also someone else. There was the word. He tells us two things about the word. The word was with God and the word was God. That the word was with God expresses relationship, companionship. They were together. And they were both together in eternity existing. Not only were they together, he tells us this, the word was God. Whatever you can attribute truly to God, you can also truly attribute to the word in his nature. This is profound. We have, we have not, we didn't know this before. We read the rest of Genesis, it doesn't tell us this. The rest of the Old Testament does not tell us this. Not until we get to John does he say there's a little more to the story. There's actually the word. And I like how D.A. Carson couches it. He says he was God's eternal fellow and yet God's very own self. Now, why does John use the word word? We read that and go, I, I don't know if that makes it more clear or more confusing. It's a little bit weird to me, but... If you were a Hebrew, if you were a Jew, and you knew your Old Testament, this would strike you as, wow, profound. A Hebrew a Jew might say this, oh, I know, I know the word in the Old Testament. Psalm 33, verse 6, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. The word was involved in creation. He was the very agent that created all things. Jeremiah chapter one, verses four and five, the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I knew you, I formed you in your mother's womb. I appointed you a prophet to all nations. The word was involved in revelation, revealing God's truth to people, specifically here, Jeremiah. Not only that, Psalm 107, verse 20, the word came and brought healing. The word came and brought deliverance. The word was also involved in healing and delivering people. Not only that, Isaiah 55, 11, God sends out his word and when he does, it does not return void. It accomplishes the purposes for which he sent it. So when the word goes out, the word is victorious. So when you calculate all the uses of word here, we see that the word of God was involved in creation, revelation, healing, deliverance, and victory. You hear that and go, Wow, that's incredible. John continues here. He says that he was in the beginning with God. And you go, well, why, did he, why is he saying it again? I'm pretty sure he just said that. 
Why say it again? You say something again because you want it to be clear and you want it to be understood. What's interesting in this verse is that word he, it's not a pronoun, a personal pronoun in the Greek. It's a demonstrative pronoun. Demonstrative pronouns are important. John uses them all the time. They are pointing pronouns. We say that man, those kids, these people over here, right? So when John says this, he goes, that man, that one was in the beginning with God. Like, did you hear what I just said? And then he says this, all things were made through him. Without him, nothing was made that was made. Every single thing, visible and invisible, owes its existence to the word of God. Not one thing can you think of that came into being apart from his agency, apart from him as creator. When you go to the store and you buy clothes, I'm pretty sure they all have it. They'll have a tag and it'll say, made in China. (laughs) Or, not all of them, or made in the USA. You go to a toy store, made in Taiwan, right? They all have some kind of tag or imprint that signifies where it came from. As you look out in creation, what do you see? As you're at your home and you're thinking about looking at your kitchen window, what things do you see? As you're driving up to go on vacation somewhere, what things do you see in creation? Every single thing you see, you have got to see there's an invisible tag or a stamp on it that says this, made by the word of God. I don't want to ruin the story just yet. Not that I'm going to ruin it. (laughs) But I like to experience the story as it's given to us. But I'll, I'll jump ahead a little bit. This is Jesus. Everything was made through the agency of the Son of God, of Jesus Christ, including you and me. He says this, in him was life. What kind of life are we talking about here? Well, verse three just said that he was the creator. So this must be some kind of creating life in which it's talking about. In him was this creating life and the life, that creating life was the light of men. Light here speaking of revelation, revealing something. You see, he's not only the agent of creation, he's the agent of revelation. He is the revealing light. The creator is also the revealing light to the world, and he says this, and the light shines in the darkness. When John speaks of darkness, he is not speaking of a physical place so much. He's speaking of a moral understanding of that place. The light shines into a rebellious, corrupt, evil, and perverted world. When John speaks about the world, it's not glorifying it with sunshine and flowers. It's telling us how bad it is And this glorifies the light and how great the light is that it would still shine to this broken world. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. Some of your versions might have did not overcome it. It seems that John is possibly being intentionally vague here. It could be either of these words. We were teaching the youth a couple weeks ago. When you look up a definition of a word, which one is it? We use the word sick. Yo, dog, that's sick. (laughs) Versus, excuse me, doctor, my daughter is sick. Context helps us tell the difference. When we look at context, it's really hard to see the difference. Both of these could well be true. I lean towards this, that it speaks more of they did not overcome it, meaning it speaks of victory. He's still bringing some sort of victory. So we have the one picture. What's the one picture? God has fully revealed himself and his salvation in a person, but it's really vague here. All we really have is the light shining into the darkness, the creating, saving, revealing, eternal God, which is also the word. Now we're gonna be given more details here in verse six, the second re- reiteration of this picture. He says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. We're given more details here. There's something to do with belief now. We weren't told that in the first five verses. He was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. 
that, there's that pointing pronoun again, that was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. God has not only shined his light, he has also sent a forerunner to prepare the way so we could understand who that light actually is. There seems to be confusion. People were thinking it's John. John makes very clear, not this guy, it's that guy, this one. And we're gonna get more details in the rest of chapter one as we are given John's testimony. But for now, he makes very clear, it's not me. John tells us something very shocking now. He says this, he was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. This could be either they didn't know him, like, oh, I didn't know it was you, man, totally missed it. Sorry, my bad. Or this could be they didn't know him in the sense of rejection. He came to his own. Now I think we're talking more specifically about the Jews. He came to his own, his very own people whom he made covenants with, saved again and again. And his own people did not receive him. Can you imagine if you were a parent and you came home to your house and your kids locked the door on you and you said, hey kids, I'm home, open the door. They said, we don't know who you are, go away. And you laugh it off, okay guys, ha ha ha, open the door, let me in. No, seriously, we don't know who you are, go away. And then you try your key and it doesn't work. And you're like, what's going on here? They close the curtains. They hold up a phone like they're dialing 911. You're like, guys, now it's not even funny. Now I'm upset. Open the door. Can you imagine how it would feel as a parent if they really carried that on and were sincere about that? You'd be hurt. Are you guys kidding me? I'm dad. I'm mom. I own this house. I own you. I'll throw you out of here if you don't let me in. I point that out to say, can you imagine the hurt that God felt in this process? He came to his very own. I made you. I created you, I thought of you, I gave you gifts, I gave you personality, I made your veins work, your heart pump, your brain tick, your eyes see, your teeth chew, I gave you everything that you needed and this is how you repay me just by rejecting me? What does that say about God? Oh, the deep, deep love of the Father that he would still come to his own even though his own are saying, get out of my face and holding up their hand to him even though we are given shocking and saddening news, we are still giving blessed and amazing news. Verse 12, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Yet there was still victory. Going back to verse five, he shined in the darkness. The darkness did not overcome it. They rejected, they said, no, we don't want it. There was still victory. God still saved as many as received him. To them he gave the right to become children of God. He explains here what it means to receive him. He says this, to those who believe in his name. To receive him is to believe in his name. You are believing in a very specific object and the truth that encompasses that object. When you believe in Jesus, you are believing in a person and you are casting your full weight on that person to the point where if you were to remove that object, you would fall down and hit the ground. He is completely holding you up. To believe in his name is to believe in his claims, to believe in what he said. It's to believe in what he has done on your behalf and what he will do on your behalf. Some people say, oh, I believe, and then they go off and live their life the way they want, not giving any attention to the actual person who saves and what he requires of them not trying for a second to obey anything he has said. That's not faith. That's not belief. That's mere acknowledgement, and then you go on your way. But to believe is to cast your full weight on the claims and the ability of someone else. In this case, Jesus. I got ahead of myself again. Because it doesn't tell us just yet. I want you to experience the narrative. It's really fun that way. On to the word. I had... I went to a preaching conference, yeah, we have those, years ago, like 2017, 18. It was with Dr. Stephen Lawson, and there was like 100 guys in a room. It was a really cool experience. And during the time there, he says, during his pastoral ministry years, someone came up to him and said this, I walked down at this altar call, three years later I went down at this altar call, 
And then years later, I went to this altar call and, did, and dedicated again. And they asked him, which one do you think I got saved at? Talk about a tough question. <laughs> no idea. Here's what he said. I thought it was really insightful. He said, when did your life change? He said, when was, or at least I'll say this, when was, when was there transformation? To truly believe on Christ shows the transformative work of God. You're not the same. Your heart begins to desire differently. You begin to think differently. You begin to act differently. You're aligned now with Jesus and his truth and you want to live according to it. You're by no means perfect. You will make mistakes. But, but the trajectory and the path shifted and you're walking a different path, a different fork in the road. He explained what it means to receive him. He explains now what it means to be a child of God. He says this in verse 13. They were born. Being a child of God has something to do with birth, a rebirth, what we call being born again. He says they were born not of blood. Blood speaks of a blood relationship. It speaks of coming from your ancestors. This is something the Jews would struggle with. Abraham's my dad. I'm good. Bloodline. Totally good. No, nope, that's not how you're born of God. That's not how you become his child. Nor, he says, are they born of the will of the flesh. This speaks of a procreative act, intimacy between a husband and a wife. That doesn't produce salvation either. It's not something we can do. And nor, he says, is it the will of man. It's not human design. It's not something you can conjure up on your own. But they are born of God. To be God's child, to be born again, is a work of God, not a work of man. We will be given more detail here in chapter three when Jesus and Nicodemus talk about being born again. And so we have the one picture. Jesus has revealed himself and his salvation in a person. I'm sorry, God has revealed himself and his salvation in a person. And we were given a little more detail. At first, we were given the light. The word is the light that shines in the darkness and it's still victorious. And now we see that when the light shined in the darkness, the darkness said, no, we don't want nothing to do with you but he still saved those. And what was the victory? They were given the opportunity to become children of God. We are now given stunning detail on the last reiteration of this picture. Verse 14, he says this, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the one and